Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today is Sunday, November 15th, and um, I will be presenting to you lecture number three. Um, before I begin with that, I remind you that later today you're going to receive an email that, in addition to the link to this video, will be the assignment for lecture number three, and that assignment will be due um, on Saturday, November 21st, emailed to me by midnight, okay? So we continue this, um, this schedule. And um, as I always do, I remind you to do your own work, please. Um, you know, if, if, if you're doing your own work, you're listening to the lectures, the, the assignments come right from the lecture, and later when you take your midterm and your final exams, um, those tests are strictly based on the lectures and the assignments that you're doing. So if you're doing these assignments as you should be, um, you're preparing yourself for those exams. Your final grade is based on the exams and the assignments. And again, I remind you that I read the assignments, so um, please make sure you're doing your own work, okay? So today we're going to talk about the topic of understanding vehicle space, um, in particular the needs of your vehicle, um, the space around it and how you deal with that space and control it. We're also going to talk about the natural laws and balance that are related to driving. And some of this touches on, um, you know, well, all of it touches on the laws of physics. And for uh, many of you, um, some of what we're going to talk about is um, paralleling what you're learning in your physics class. Um, having said that, if you're not taking physics, please don't think you're at a disadvantage, okay? Because this is pretty basic stuff. It's not overly scientific. So we start with the controls um, of driving the vehicle, accelerating, braking, and steering. Those are the three examples of controls that you should be familiar with. Now, when we talk about controls, we talk about how the driver manages the speed and the placement of the vehicle, okay? And th when you think about it, that's what the driver does. The driver manages the speed of the vehicle and where the vehicle is, its direction, its placement. And there are three channels through which we manage speed and placement. And those three channels are the accelerator, the brakes, and the steering wheel, okay? So when we talk about controls of speed and placement, we're talking about your accelerator, your brakes, and your steering wheel. And I'm going to state a very basic concept right now that um, at the very end of this lecture, I'm gonna come back to. And that concept has to do with the idea of smoothness. When you are operating the controls, accelerator, brakes, and steering wheel, it is most important that you do so smoothly and naturally, okay? In the beginning, as you're driving the car, you know, for the first few times with your instructor, you're probably um, noticing, and everybody's different, some more to, to a greater degree than others, um, but, you know, many of you are noticing that abruptness, okay? whether the car is stopping abruptly, whether your turns, your, your turning of the wheel is too sharp or too, too short or too rough, um, that smooths out. And I always tell my students in the car that in time, you're gonna see that become much more smooth and natural, okay? Um, that comes with practice and experience. But that smoothness is extremely important because in order to safely operate and control your vehicle, you need to be able to utilize the accelerator, the brakes, and the steering wheel in connection to each other as well as separately. You need to be able to do that all very smoothly and seamlessly, okay? Um, let's just say something about the term visual input. Obviously, your most important sense when you're driving is your sense of sight, vision, okay? Um, and your attention to driving and how you direct your visual search are very important. If you remember in an earlier lecture, and I think it was the last lecture, might have been the one before, we talked about the aggressive visual search where you're taking in 
the, the entire scene, you know, 12 to 15 seconds ahead and then 20 to 30 seconds ahead, okay? So it's very important that visual input is vital to controlling the vehicle safely. And the visual input is really de de defined as your attention to driving and the search pattern that you use when you drive, okay? Your eyes will see whatever the brain directs them to see. And that's where attention is most important. You know, obviously to be a good driver, you need to be paying attention. And so your brain, as you know, is what controls the things that you're looking at and how you're looking at them. And if you're attentive, what that means is you're allowing your brain to direct your eyes to do the appropriate search. So when you're driving, you're searching for objects or conditions that are within, along, or closing on your path of travel. Let me repeat that. So when you're driving, you're searching for objects or conditions that are within your path of travel, okay, the area around your car, along your path of travel, okay, as you're, as you're moving forward, the area in front of you, and closing on your path of travel. And so, in particular, with that last part, closing, we're talking about what's happening right in front of you, that 12 to 15 seconds, okay? Um, so all of that, whether it's, you know, your eyes focusing on objects or conditions within your path of travel, the area right around your car, along your path of travel, the area in front of your car, and closing on your path of travel. And the immediate closing is that 12 to 15 seconds of your aggressive visual search. But your direct attention is beyond that, right? It goes as far as 20 to 30 seconds ahead, okay? So you're always anticipating the changes in road conditions as you get further and further along. Um, and let's keep in mind that when you're considering the um, objects and conditions within, along, and closing on your path of travel, you're, you're also not only looking straight ahead, but you're also considering the periphery, what's going on in the sides of your car and the sides of the path of travel that you're approaching. Peripheral, right? Vision. So, of course, that's extremely important, okay? Um, and so a good driver has to know how his or her vehicle is relating to other objects on the road. You should always know whether you can safely move into a planned space ahead, to the side, or even to the rear if you're backing up of your vehicle. So again, you need to know whether your movement forward, to the side, or behind you is safe, okay? And how your vehicle then relates to other objects, all right? And so that brings us to the concept of vehicle operating space. And we define your operating space is defined as how there must be adequate space in front of, to the sides of, and to the rear of your vehicle. That's what your operating space is. Another term for operating space, which may make it um, even more um, understandable for you conceptually, is the term space cushion. There should always be a space cushion around your vehicle, meaning there's space in front of you, there's space to the sides of you, and there's space to the rear of you. Now, front and rear, you know, if you're, if you're too close to the car in front of you, well, you need to roll back a little bit to give yourself space. If the guy behind you is tailgating you, you need to, you know, um, either speed up a little bit, if, if in fact you can without exceeding the speed limit, slow down and let him pass, or even pull over and let him pass. That's how you maintain the space cushion behind you. The space cushions to the right and the left, you control them when you can. You know, there are times when you can't, right? 
you know, if I'm in traffic, I can't control what's to the right and left of me. If I'm in a, on a three-lane highway and, you know, and it's heavy traffic, well, you know, there's, there, there's going to be a car next to me and a car to my left of me, okay, to the left of me. But if you can control that, that's what you try to do, right? So ideally, you want space on your right and left side. If you can have it on both sides, that's great, okay? Um, but remember, your job as a driver is to do your best to maintain the space cushion around you, okay? Now, why is that space cushion important? Why is there the need for that space cushion? Well, the need for that space cushion is directly connected to your speed, right? Um, the faster you go, the more space you need around your vehicle, front, behind, right, and left. So the bigger the space cushion that's required um, when you're going faster, okay? And the reason for that, and again, you know from the laws of physics, that the faster you're going, the more space you need to slow down and stop. And therefore, the more space you need, the more time you need, right? So space and time, um, you know, distance and time and speed, laws of physics, all those, um, all those concepts are connected, right? By miscalculating space, what you're doing is you're miscalculating the amount of space needed based on your speed, and in particular, if you need to stop um, or slow down, you need to have the space and the time to do that. Now, I may have mentioned this in an earlier lecture. The, um, the thing I tell students all the time in the car is the one car length rule per 10 miles an hour. And I think that's a, just a great way to keep a, a sense of, you know, cars, in particular cars in front and behind, of you, behind you. In other words, one car length for every 10 miles an hour. If I'm driving at 30 miles an hour, I should be able to fit three cars between me and the car in front of me. If I'm doing 30 miles an hour and I can't fit three cars conceptually, then I'm too close to the car in front of me and I wouldn't have enough time to slow down and stop if I needed to. So if I'm doing 60 miles an hour, I should be able to fit six cars in between me and the car in front of me. The same thing behind me. So if I'm doing 30 miles an hour, the guy behind me should be a minimum of three car lengths away from me. And, you know, obviously, we, especially behind you, it's harder to conceptualize the three car lengths. But again, if you're looking in your rear view mirror and you see the guy is, is really close to you, you know, um, you need to be able to act accordingly. And again, that means letting him pass you, okay, or pulling over, whatever the case may be, all right? Now, um, so again, the purpose for the space cushion is really to allow enough distance to stop in response to a threatening object or condition. You need to be able to anticipate that there may be a threatening object or road condition and therefore, you need to be able to stop, if necessary, based on what's going on with that obstacle, okay? And I go back to identifying a planned path of travel 12 to 15 seconds ahead. That 12 to 15 second zone is the action zone, right? If you remember, we talked about visual, vis aggressive visual search. The 20 to 30 seconds ahead is not the area that I have to act on right away. It's what I anticipate is gonna be going on in 20 to 30 seconds. But it's that 12 to 15 second time frame ahead of me. That zone is the zone that will require or may require immediate action. And so I always have to have a sense of an alternate path of travel. You know, whether, um, you know, um, whether it's, it's, you know, to the right or the left, um, if I see that my pathway is blocked. Now, 
going back to that space cushion on the sides, and that's why the sides are, are so important, okay? Um, I should be able to veer my car to the right or the left if necessary. Something is happening within that 12 to 15 second zone. And of course, if I have cars to my right and the left, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. Now, if I'm stuck in traffic, you know, and we're stopping and starting on a highway, and I got cars to the right and the left of me, nothing I can do about that. But there really isn't going to be the need, right? Because traffic is pretty much at a standstill. But if I'm driving, say, 40, 50 miles an hour in the middle lane, and there's a car to my right who's also doing 40, 50 miles an hour, there's nobody to my left, well, my left is good. But I probably want to give, you know, maybe let him pass me a little bit on the right, or assuming I'm not going to exceed the speed limit, I want to pass him on the right. Because my instinct is always to do everything I can to maintain the space cushion, whether it's to the right or the left, or in front or behind. Okay? All right, so um, let's talk about referencing the vehicle to the path of travel. When I say visual referencing, I want to always have a sense of a point that relates to some part of the roadway and my part and, and some part of my vehicle. Okay. Um, you know, and, and there are exercises that some instructors teach where, you know, you say, okay, it should take me 12 seconds, you know, between where my car is and where that pole is um, for me to pass that pole, okay? If it takes more than 12 seconds, then maybe I'm going too slow. If it takes less than 12 seconds, maybe I'm going too fast. I don't want to get into that because to me that, that just kind of overcomplicates things. I want to stick to, with you, I'd like to stick to the one car length for every 10 miles an hour. To me, that's the simplest concept, okay? Um, if you're thinking that all the time, in front of you and behind you, you really can't go wrong, you know? I mean, it's an easy concept, I think, to grasp, okay? Um, so if you stick to that, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be okay. Um, but understand, you know, perception of that space and time that 10 miles for every 10, um, one car length for every 10 miles an hour is dependent on, in other words, sense of space cushion is dependent on certain variables. And there are five in particular that I want to just mention to you. In other words, these five things will affect your ability to maintain that space cushion, thus to judge the distance between you and other things, vehicles, objects around you. Number one, eye dominance. How good is your vision? And of course you need to have 20-20 vision as best as possible in order to drive. So if you need corrective lenses, contact lenses or glasses, you know, you'll need to wear them and that'll appear on your license. Okay, that corrective lens is required. So eye ability, eye dominance is important. Number two, seat adjustment. And we talked about that in the very beginning. If your seat is too far or too close, you're going to have difficulty judging the distances around your vehicle. Number three, the seat height. And not every car, you know, allows you to elevate the seat, okay, up and down. Some of the new models do, some don't, okay. My suggestion is that um, in, if you're a, a person who's very short, it might be a good idea to use a pillow when you drive. You know, you want to be able to see over the dashboard. And some people are very short and, you know, they need that extra boost, okay? Um, if you're very tall, it's probably a good idea to, to um, buy yourself a bigger vehicle, all right? So your, your, your head's not hitting the ceiling, all right? Um, so seat height is important, you know, and your height is directly connected to that. Head movement, 
you know, are you looking at, are you looking straight ahead? Is does your head, you know, veer slightly to the right and the left as you're driving to check your peripherals? Okay, that's of course important. And the fifth variable is the type of vehicle that you're driving. So the bigger the vehicle, you know, the perhaps the the um, the the um, less you have to, the more you have to turn your steering wheel when you make a turn. Or maybe you need to give yourself a little more space between you and the car in front of you if you're driving a truck versus if you're driving a car. So again, the five variables that can influence your perception when you're driving, okay, your judgment of that space cushion would be your eyesight, your seat adjustment, Okay, whether it's forward or backward, the seat height, whether you need that pillow or not, okay, whether you can adjust the seat up and down, the movement of your head, and the type of vehicle that you're driving. <clears throat> okay, so um, we're going to shift gears a bit now to um, other factors. You know, when we talk about the physical laws of the laws of physics and we talk about driving, um, of course, you know, we talk about space cushion, we talk about the things we just discussed, but we also need to consider the road itself and um, your vehicle in relation to the road. So we're talking about the road surface and we're talking about what's called traction. And let's start with that word traction. By definition, traction is the adhesion, friction, or grip between your road surface and your tires. I'll repeat that. Traction is defined as adhesion, friction, or grip between the road surface and the tires of your car. I always focus on that word grip because to me that's much more accessible visually, conceptually, I think, than friction and adhesion. I think you, if you're taking physics, you know what friction is, right? Friction is the force of the surface that goes against your movement, you know? So friction is designed to slow you down, right? Um, but if we stick with the word grip, understand that your tire must have a grip on the surface of the, the road in order for your car not to go too fast or too slow, okay? So that grip, what is it that keeps you in control? It's the grip that your tire has on the road. If you don't have that grip, if you don't have what's called that traction, then you will not be able to steer, brake, or accelerate. You know, without that traction, you can't control your vehicle, okay? So loss of traction leads to loss of control and thus, you have situations where you're skidding, you know, where you're veering off the road. And of course, that's most undesirable. Now, traction of the road and connection to your car, that grip is going to vary based on three major components. So the traction, the grip that your car has to the road varies based on three variables, three things. Number one, speed. Number two, tire condition. And number three, roadway surface. So the three factors that influence traction are speed, tire condition, and roadway surface, okay? There are two of those three things as a driver that you can control. You can control your speed and you can control the condition of your tires, but you cannot control the road surface. And so you have to recognize the road surface in order to adjust your speed and direction accordingly. Okay, and we're gonna talk about different types of road surfaces, but as you're driving, you need to be able to recognize what the surface of the road is like in front of you, particularly if it changes, so you can adjust the speed of your vehicle and the direction of your vehicle. Your tire condition, you, you, you need to take a look at your tires, not just to check if they're flat or not, not just to check if they need air or not, 
but you also need to get them checked regularly to make sure that the, the, the treads on the tire are, are you know, not damaged or, or, or disappearing. And so what I mean by that is if you look at a tire, a good tire, there are ridges, okay, those openings that need to be there because that's what helps to filter through the fluids on the road, the, the debris on the road, um, and thus it helps your tire to grip the road more firmly. As tires get old, that tread starts to close, okay? And eventually you get what's called a bold tire. A bold tire is where there is little to no tread. And if you have a tire with little to no tread, it significantly affects your traction, and thus you need new tires. Um, you know, the donut in the car, the spare tire that you put on your car if you have a flat, that's really designed to get you just to the gas station to go very small dif distances. Because the next time, if, if you ever take a look at your spare tire, the donut, you'll see that the donut has very little tread, if any. You know, and so it's, it's very important that if you're driving with the donut, that you're driving more slowly and you're driving shorter distances because you don't have that tread. The donut, in essence, is a very bold tire, okay? It's just designed for temporary purposes. Now, going back to the road itself, the surface material, the material that is used to build that road and or the, what's on that surface is going to affect your traction. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to list for you six types of road surfaces. And I'm listing them from the greatest traction to the least. Okay, so the, um, the top one or two are much safer to drive on than the bottom two. So there are six, and it's going from the greatest traction to the least. So number one, your best is concrete, okay? And you might say, well, if concrete is the best, then why don't they build our, all of our roads using concrete? Well, they build all of our roads using number two, for the most part, asphalt, okay? Asphalt is second. And the reason they use asphalt instead of concrete is asphalt is cheaper and it's easier to use when you're building things, okay? So um, number one is concrete. There are concrete roads out there, but a lot of the roads you're going to see for the most part, especially in the city, especially in Staten Island, is number two asphalt. And we can go a step further. There's good asphalt and there's cheaper asphalt. And most of the time um, you're gonna see, unfortunately, the city using cheaper asphalt and thus you get potholes, <laughs> all right? Um, number three would be brick or polished concrete. Okay, so concrete in itself, untouched, has the best traction. But number three, if you polish it, if there's some kind of veneer on the concrete, you've reduced the traction and you've dropped into the third slot. And of course, brick is also in that third slot. And that makes sense because you think of brick, brick is not um, as smooth as concrete or asphalt, you know, that might have ridges. And of course, you know, you, your bricks, you know, have spaces between them. So that's going to affect your traction. Number four is dirt, a dirt road. Okay, if you're ever in the country and you're driving on a dirt road, you need to be especially careful. Number five is gravel. You know, and when we talk about gravel, we're talking about, you know, those rocks, right? That if you're on a gravel road, and number six would be sand over a hard surface. All right, so, um, you know, that hard surface, whether it's concrete or asphalt or brick, once you have sand on top of it, now you've significantly diminished your traction. So I'll repeat, number one is concrete, number two is asphalt, number three is brick or polished concrete, number four is dirt road, number five is a gravel road, and number six is a hard surface road that has sand over it, okay? Um, you know, that's gonna give you the least traction of the six. Now, 
conditions that affect traction. So let's talk about that a little more specifically. Okay, and obviously road, the, the surface itself, we, we just said, you know, is significant in terms of traction with concrete giving you the best and sand on a hard surface giving you the worst, okay? Number one, substances on the road. Whenever you have any substance on the road, it's going to affect traction negatively, okay? Um, so if you have, a, for instance, if you're driving and you see the sewer cover, okay, well, that's a metal substance that is, is um, an area where there is, you, know, you don't have the asphalt anymore, so you have to be very careful of that. You also have to be careful driving over the sewer cover, not only because it's a different form of, of road surface, but it also might have substances on it as well, since you know workers open and close that to do work. Um, paint on the road, vinyl strips on the road, tar, wet leaves, sand, loose gravel, or mud. And I'm gonna repeat that. Whenever you have any of these substances on the road surface, they will affect your traction negatively. Thus, you need to slow down and you need to maybe grip your steering wheel a little more firmly because you are running into the possibility of losing traction. Whether it's a sewer cover, paint, a vinyl strip, tar, wet leaves, sand, loose gravel, or mud. Now, there's one exception with sand, and that's when you have an icy road, okay? Um, and my point is this. Ice is always bad. If you have, you know, just, just pure ice, then you're in much more danger traction-wise than if there's sand on the ice. And that's, of course, why, you know, um, you have the salt spreaders. Um, salt is in sand, but what it does is it melts the ice. Sand will tend to melt the ice, and salt, of course, does it much more effectively, okay? Other things that may be on the road that will affect your traction, oil, radiator fluid, um, rubber that's left by the vehicle. You know, if a car skids and it leaves rubber on the road, okay, from its starts and stops. All right, so those are a few other things on the surface that could affect your traction, okay? Um, and looking at road surfaces, you know, more structurally, any poor road conditions are going to affect your traction. So anytime you have a surface that is rippled, that is not flat, you've affected your traction in a negative way, and you need to be very careful. And the best example of this that we can relate to, especially in Staten Island, are potholes. You know, and I urge you to be very careful when you're driving because a pothole can really destroy your car. You, you can get a flat tire very easily if you go over a pothole too quickly. There are a lot of potholes in Staten Island, and there are really two main reasons for that. Number one, as I mentioned before, the asphalt that they use is not as, um, as, as um, top-notch as it should be, okay? So it's a matter of saving money. Number two, the drainage in Staten Island, water-wise, is very poor, you know? So the water that sits destroys the asphalt and creates these ridges. That's why we see m many more potholes because of snow and ice. You know, they weigh down on the asphalt and they create these poor road conditions. Um, the best rule to keep in mind in terms of weather, so when we talk about, you know, rain, we talk about drizzle, we talk about, you know, um, snow flurries, any kind of moisture, and you're dealing with wet leaves, um, the rule of thumb that I always tell students, you know, from the standpoint of safety, is that the worst time to drive during a rain, when rain is, is you know, happening, is at the beginning of that rainstorm. Usually. Now, I'm not, you know, if, if we're talking about torrential rain, that's a whole different story. Now your vision is, is not only is your car um, being affected by the huge amount of water, but also your visibility, okay? But as a general rule, you need to be more careful when it starts raining 
than when it's been raining for, let's say, you know, a half hour or an hour. And the reason is because when it first starts raining, when there's that drizzle, the substances such as the leaves and the oil and whatever debris is on the road has not been washed away yet. And so that contributes to loss of traction and then thus is more dangerous. Okay, so remember that. You know, if you're driving and it just starts raining, you need to understand that's the most critical time than, say, when it's been raining for you know, a half hour or so, okay? Now, one term that, you know, I'm, I want you to be familiar with in terms of water on the road is the term hydroplaning. Hydroplaning is when your tires no longer have contact with the road. So you're basically water skiing when you're hydroplaning, okay? Um, and, of course, that's going to happen when there's a lot of rain, you know, when there's a lot of water on the road. And so once you hydroplane, you've now lost control of your vehicle and you, you've created a very, obviously a very dangerous situation. Now, I, I wanna give you a couple of numbers here because this really emphasizes how prevalent hydroplaning can be, okay? And it emphasizes why you need to slow down when it's raining, all right? Um, hydroplaning can occur under these two circumstances, number-wise, speed and, um, and amount of water. When you're doing 35 miles per hour and you have one twelfth of an inch of water on the road, your car can hydroplane. Now, let me repeat that, okay? And just use this as a reference point. If I'm doing, say, 35 miles per hour and the roads are wet, all I need is one twelfth of an inch of water on the road for me to potentially hydroplane. One twelfth of an inch. Think how little that is. Okay? Think of an inch and then one twelfth of it. You're talking about a tiny amount of water on the road that can contribute to hydroplaning if I'm doing 35 miles per hour. So what do you do? Well, you don't do 35 miles per hour when there's the potential for one twelfth of an inch of rain on the road. You do less than that, considerably less than that, okay, depending on how much rain is on the road. So that's why when people don't adjust their speed in the rain, that's why accidents become much more prevalent. And it's a shame because a lot of people just maintain their speed um, and not, you know, are not sensitive to the amount of water on the road. So there are certain factors that, that contribute to hydroplaning. The main one, of course, is speed. Number two is tire inflation. Number three is the tread on your tire. And number four is the depth of the water. I'll repeat that. Speed, tire inflation, why don't we say instead of tread, just say tire condition, okay, for number three. So if your tires are old, again, you're not going to have the same tread. You're not going to be able to filter through the rain and the substances on the road the same and the depth of the water, okay? Those are the factors that influence hydroplane. Um, another factor that um, influences traction would be temperature changes. Okay, so um, understand that as temperatures um, rise from below freezing to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the icy conditions become more slippery. Okay, um, as you get closer, as you get it right around that 32 degree Fahrenheit point, the road is going to become more slippery because the ice is, you know, um, um, the, the, the ice is becoming loose and thus the um, substances on the road, all right? So wet ice, the point I'm making here is that wet ice is more slippery than dry ice. That may surprise you. So my point is this, if it's 10 degrees out and there's ice on the road, that's bad. You, you obviously want to avoid the ice if you can. And if you have to go over it, you want to go very slow because ice is always bad, okay? But if it's 28 degrees or 30 degrees 
or 32 degrees, that ice is starting to become wet, particularly at 32 degrees. It's starting to melt. And that ice is more dangerous than the ice at 10 degrees. Okay? So wet ice is more slippery than dry ice. Um, and intersections, when it's icy, tend to be more slippery for vehicles than non-intersections. Because think about it. At an intersection, there's more stopping and starting. And so there's more melting of the ice, and there's more than creation of wet ice. Okay? Um, other factors that influence traction, road conditions, bridge surfaces, overpasses, shaded areas, all of those may tend to have freezing before other road surfaces. Think about it, a bridge surface or an overpass. You know, it's, it's higher up, there might be more winds, it might be colder. So water is going to freeze more quickly, okay? Um, shaded areas, obviously, are colder than areas out in the sun. So you need to keep that in mind. And a lot of this is common sense, right? Um, and also keep in mind when you're um, on a bridge or on an overpass on a cold day, particularly a windy day, that wind tends to be stronger. And so it could affect your steering. So the traction is affected. All right. And then, of course, patches of ice in general or patches of wet leaves are going to cause unequal traction. So that's where you need to slow down and start up. And you, uh, you need to take in that, you know, 12 to 15 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds. Road design also affects traction. So um, there are two types of roads that I want you to keep in mind here. The first is a banked road, and the banked road is typically fa found at curves, where the road curves. You see the road, so if you're approaching a curve, oftentimes the road is no longer just flat, it starts tilting up one way or the other. So that's what you call a banked road, okay? And then there's a crowned road, so a road that doesn't have a flat surface, it has kind of a hump surface, okay? So road design is very important, particularly the banked road and the crowned road. Let's talk about shoulders. Shoulders affect traction, okay? Shoulders are important when you're on the highway. And when we talk about the shoulder, we talk about that area right on the side of the road, where if you're having car trouble, if there's an emergency, you pull off the highway and you go onto the shoulder. Understand that the traction may be different on the shoulder, and it usually is. It's more ridged because it's designed to slow your car down. So you need to anticipate that change of traction, okay? It, the road itself may be rougher than the highway itself. There may be more loose materials on the shoulder of the road. People changing their tires, oil, their, their tires, oil sand, you know, you might encounter more um, debris on the shoulder, so you need to anticipate that. You need to anticipate the possibility of broken glass or any other kinds of waste materials on the shoulder of a road, okay? One thing you should never do, and I, you know, I've seen this before, but I, I think most people understand this, you know, you never want to ride with two wheels on the shoulder and two wheels on the main road. You know, you, you, once you're, if you're getting off onto that shoulder, you're slowing down naturally and you're getting onto the shoulder fully. You know, you, you want to go, f you, you don't want to have side, your, your right two wheels on the shoulder and your left two wheels on the main road, really for any length of time. You want to get right onto that shoulder, okay? Um, and so the, the rule, the, ultimately the common sense rule is you need to, um, you need to um, demonstrate extreme care whenever you're entering or leaving a shoulder. Okay, so um, now we want to shift gears a little more closely to what are known as the natural laws. And you probably studied these in physics or continuing to study them. There is a term that you may or may not have used in physics, and the term is inertia, I-N-E-R-T-I-A, I-N-E-R-T-I-A, inertia. 
And before we define inertia, you want to understand first and foremost that inertia affects the traction of um, your car and the road. It affects traction, okay? Um, the basic definition of inertia is based on Newton's laws. And you know from Newton's laws that an object in motion continues to move straight ahead until it is acted, by some, acted on by some outside force. So think about that. The natural law of physics, as we're stating it here, the law of inertia says that an object in motion continues at that same speed and in that same direction unless it's acted on by an outside force. It's only when some outside force acts on that object that it changes either its speed, goes faster or slower, or its direction, veers more to the right or the left. In life, there is, in real life, we don't see inertia in its purest form. If you're in a vacuum, you will. So if there were no outside forces, Newton says, an object will just keep going in that direction, straight, and at that same speed, forever. It's only when those outside forces, and the most common one that you've probably seen in mechanics is the force of friction, the surface, <clears throat> that slows down the object. Or if you're in terms of driving a car, when you turn the wheel, you go against that inertia and you change the direction of the car, okay? Now, when you do those things too suddenly, that's when you create a problem with, you know, the, with safety, with traction. You know, so if, I'm go, if I suddenly go too fast or stop short, right? Or I suddenly turn the wheel abruptly. Remember in the beginning, I talked about being smooth. That's when you um, end up getting yourself in trouble. Think about turning a corner, okay? Um, in particular, um, let's, let's talk about a curve. So let's say I'm approaching a curve. The law of inertia says my car wants to keep going straight, okay? Now, I need to adjust my speed and my steering to counter that law of inertia in order for me to go around the curve. If I'm going too fast and I'm not adjusting my speed and I'm also not adjusting my steering wheel, the law of inertia is going to keep me going straight. And what's going to happen? Well, the road curves, but I go right off the road. Okay? And of course, so in other words, you need to, as drivers, you need to work with the law of inertia to make sure that you have safe traction. And, you know, again, the best example of that, I think, is a curve. You know, you need to adjust your speed and your direction to negotiate the curve safely because the law of inertia is going to direct your car to keep going straight and, you, and to keep at the same speed. And that's going to send you veering off the curve, okay? And so, in essence, unless that traction, unless your grip on the road is great enough to overcome that force of inertia, your car is going to slide outside of the curve or the turn, okay? And you control that. You control that through steering and through your accelerator and your brake. So what are the factors that influence the effect of inertia? There are five of them. Number one, the sharpness of the curve or the turn. Number two, your speed. Number three, the size, height, weight, and load of your vehicle. I'll repeat these. Number four, the roadway slope. And number five, the roadway surface condition. Excuse me. So what is it that's going to affect your car that's going to impact whether your car is going at a certain speed in a certain direction, okay? And thus is going to affect how your car moves and reacts, and thus is gonna affect your safety. 
So the five factors influencing the effect of inertia would be, number one, the sharpness of the curve of the turn, right? So you have to adjust your speed and your steering based on how sharp that curve is. Number two, your speed, how fast you're going, is going to determine how you work with inertia. Number three, the size, height, and weight of your vehicle, as well as the load of the vehicle, how much you're carrying. So the simple you know, thing to think about is, well, doesn't it make sense that if I'm driving a truck and I'm approaching a particular curve, I'm probably going to need to go slower and to steer differently than if I'm driving a sedan, a regular car, okay? And what's in that truck, what's in that vehicle, the weight of it is also going to affect my speed and my steering as I deal with inertia. Number four, the slope of the roadway. So it's not just the curve, but it's whether it's, you know, um, as you're going up into the curve or out of the curve, whether it's at an incline. And of course, number five, the roadway surface condition. Then of course, there's gravity, which is, is also going to affect, obviously, how you work with, um, you know, um, control of the vehicle. Of course, we know what gravity is. And we understand that gravity is going to affect the vehicle's traction and performance, right? And it's very simple. In other words, if I'm going up a hill, I'm going to need to accelerate more, use that accelerator more than if I'm going down the hill. So your speed and, um, and control of the car are always impacted by gravity, okay? Another term you should be familiar with is kinetic energy. You may have learned in physics that kinetic energy, K-I-N-E-T-I-C, is the amount of energy needed to move something, okay? Motion doesn't exist unless it has kinetic energy. So the amount of energy needed to move something is affected by the vehicle's weight and speed. In other words, if I want to get my car to go 60 miles an hour versus my 18-wheel truck, I'm going to need a lot more energy to make that 18-wheel truck go 60 than my car, right? Um, and therefore, braking distances are directly connected to kinetic energy, okay? And remember, we talk about the relationship between speed and distance. And, you know, from physics, there's all the formulas, right? Kinetic energy is related to the size of something, you know, one-half mv squared, the velocity of something, the amount of energy needed. Um, and the, one of the, the, the laws of kinetic energy tells us, in terms of distance, and we talked about this a little bit before, but now I want to talk about it more specifically, um, the relationship between your speed and your distance is as follows. If you double your speed, then you need um, four times the stopping distance. So it's the square of the, to, um, to stop a vehicle, you um, increase the distance based on the square of the amount of speed. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm doing 20 miles an hour. And I double that 20 to 40. The distance I need to stop my car at 40 miles an hour is four times the distance it would be to stop my car at 20. So you don't double the distance, you quadruple the distance. I'll repeat that. If I'm doing 20 miles an hour and I want to stop my car, there's a certain amount of distance I need to stop my car, right? And you know, that, that makes sense, right? If I double my speed, now I'm doing 40 miles an hour, the distance I need to stop my car is four times what it was at 20, not double what it was at 20, okay? And that's connected to the laws of kinetic energy, the amount of energy needed to make a car move, which is certainly exactly proportional to the amount of energy needed to make a car stop. 
Now, so when you think of an impact, when you think of a collision, right? Um, if I'm doing 20 miles an hour and I hit a wall versus if I'm doing 40 miles an hour and I hit a wall, well, the amount of space needed for me to stop the car at 40 is four times the amount that I needed at 20. And that space is directly related to the kinetic energy and the force of impact. So the force of impact is going to be four times greater if I'm doing 40 miles an hour and I hit that wall than it is going to be if I'm doing 20, okay? A um, little bit about vehicle suspension and balance and traction. Um, and in particular, um, we talk about balance. So a vehicle suspension balance refers in particular to the distribution of weight on the vehicle. And a lot of this is common sense, okay? Um, you know, you, you know that as you adjust your speed and your direction, in other words, as you accelerate or decelerate or as you turn, the weight, of the ve the weight on the vehicle is going to shift, okay? And that's, that shift is going to be affected by the brakes, application, steering, traction, or combination of all of those things. So the simple concept that I want you to think about is that, um, you know, the weight distribution on a vehicle is going to go in one of three different directions. It's either going to go front to rear, it's going to go rear to front, or it's going to go side to side. So let's talk about each of those three things briefly, okay? Let's talk about front to rear. And what I'd ask you to think about is if you're driving, let's say a van, and you have um, a big box that you're carrying, a very, very heavy box that you're carrying in the back of the van, okay? Maybe not that heavy, but it's heavy enough, all right? Um, when the vehicle accelerates, the faster you go, the more likely that box is going to shift to the back of the van right? That's the idea of, you know, the, the balance. And again, laws of physics, okay? Um, the faster you go, um, the more likely that box is going to shift towards the rear, okay? Let's go rear to front. Rear to front happens when I slow down. So let's suppose I'm driving that van and I stop short. What's going to happen? Well, the law of inertia says that that box wants to keep going straight at the same speed. So it's going to keep doing that, and it's going to shift forward, okay? Let's suppose that, you know, I'm turning the vehicle on a sharp left. Well, naturally, the laws of gravity and this, therefore the balance on that vehicle is going to shift the box towards the curve, towards the left. If I'm shifting to the right, it's going to shift to the right, okay? So, front to rear is when I accelerate. The box goes back, okay? Rear to front is when I slow down or stop. The box goes forward. And side to side is when I turn. The box is going to go to the left or the right. Um, think about being on an airplane, you know, and the plane's taking off, okay? And as the plane is taking off, your body is going in the reverse direction. It's going up against the back of your seat. Okay, and it's doing that because inertia says the body wants to stay the way that it was. Okay, in that case, it was stationary. It wants to stay that way. Okay, um, you know, think about when the car stops short and your body goes forward. It goes forward because your body wants to keep going in that same speed in that same direction, but the driver put the brakes on and it, and and it forced your body to stop, but it did so abruptly. That's why, of course, seatbelts are so important, okay? Um, and that goes back to what we said at the very beginning of this lecture. And notice we get full circle. And what we said at the very beginning was the concept of smoothness. That's why your steering, your braking, your accelerating needs to become smooth so you don't have those abrupt stops and starts so you don't have those inertial moments where, you know, um, 
things are happening abruptly, okay? You want them to happen smoothly. All right, ladies, gentlemen, a lot of kind of nitty-gritty technical stuff today. You know, I, I, I think today's lecture is important. I don't know that it's as important as, you know, talking about, you know, road signs and laws of the road and things like that, which we are going to get to. But I, I hope that, you know, this gave you some things to think about. Thank you and have a good Sunday.